welcome to Scary Stories. We've got a 12-story skyscraper of an episode for you today. I've put a table of contents in my pinned comment and in the description, so you can skip to whichever stories you want to watch by the title. Just click on the timestamp next to each, and you can jump backward and forward. Here are some of our scariest stories of the year so far, and each involve either a dogman or a werewolf. In fact, in this first all-new story, we aren't even sure which of the two it was. And that's why this first story's title asks the musical question, Did we see a dogman or a werewolf? Dear Scary Stories NYC, We had a very strange experience involving one or more dogman type entities and we're having trouble figuring out exactly what happened. It was me, my girlfriend I'll call Annette, her friend Sandy, and Sandy's boyfriend Tom. I was driving us all on the Pennsylvania Turnpike, heading west, somewhere south of the Tuscarora State Forest in the Hemlock Natural Area. We weren't driving toward anything in particular, but we had mutually decided to have ourselves an adventure. We reached a part of the turnpike that never had anything interesting on it before. It was just trees alongside the road. But on that night, we passed this large cutout area where all the woods had been chopped down in a straight line for a very long ways. But in that clear-cut area was what looked to us like a circus or a carnival. I couldn't actually see any people out walking around but there were big top tents, and they were lit up brightly. Tom started searching on his phone to see what this was, but there was no mention of any of it on the internet as far as he could see. We talked about how it might be set up illegally. Maybe this was a traveling circus that operated just outside the law. That made us very interested in going, since we had said we were looking for an adventure. If we had known it would lead to us being stalked by these creepy dog-headed beings, I'm sure we would have just kept driving till we found a dive bar or something. But instead, we all excitedly found the way to exit the turnpike and drive up this dark, unpaved road, or a path, really, to where this circus or carnival was. The size of the tents were quite impressive. We wondered how something like this could just spring up overnight since it was way larger than it appeared from the turnpike, and it appeared mighty large from the turnpike. We were practically the only people walking around, although I could sort of see figures moving around in the darkness at a distance. When we wandered up to the entrance of a tent, however, we found bright lights and hundreds of cheering people inside, seated around a big ring. The entire place smelled like a combination of sweat, animals, then popcorn. We grabbed some seats toward the back and watched a man make animals that we did not recognize jump through hoops. A ringmaster came out after that and spoke words that the audience responded strongly to. The four of us were asking each other, what did he just say, though? The lights went out, and then a spotlight came on in the center of the tent, revealing a dark figure huddled down on the ground. It appeared to be furry and a shade of brown. Then the figure stood up quickly, revealing himself to be a tall humanoid with the head of a wolf or a dog. Some of the audience gasped. Others cheered. We gasped. I didn't even understand what that was which I was seeing. It seemed to be a man, but it seemed to be a dog. It was very furry around the head and it had patchy fur elsewhere. The arms were mostly bare, and I could see that he was quite strong and muscular. The figure was dressed something like a barbarian in an old Conan movie. He had a necklace-type garment made of something like leather, which was strapped all around him. He wore a green sash, I suppose you'd call it, to cover his privates. Other than that, and a few adornments like leather straps around his forearms, he seemed to be pretty much on display in his birthday suit. I, for one, could not see the seams of his costume, 
either literally or figuratively. It did not look like a costume in any way. It looked like we were watching some kind of a werewolf or a dogman out there. And I wondered what kind of a circus performance a dogman would do. Well, it wasn't like anything I'd ever seen before, that's for certain. The ringmaster brought out caged animals, one by one, and released them in that tent on the floor. I could not tell you what any of those animals were, just that each one was caught by the dogman, then a larger one was brought out for him to catch next. Because this is for YouTube, I am not going to get into what happened after he caught each animal. Let's just say it was savage, and it was not pretty. The crowd reacted excitedly each time a chase reached its climax, but the girls were telling us guys that they wanted to leave. At first, Tom and I were saying we wanted to stay, and we reminded the girls that they had asked us for an adventure. That wolf man down there that we were watching was a better athlete than I'd ever seen before, and I was trying to figure out how he did some of the flips and the attacks that we were watching him do. He was a better fighter than Bruce Lee, and he was a big guy, too. For guys the age of me and Tom, this was better than watching Ultimate Fighting. The dogman by then was covered in the dark red liquid which had once been inside his victims. The girls were sickened, but Tom and I had our bloodlust activated by all of this. That was to change quickly when they brought out the next animal, and it was the first that we clearly recognized the species of. This was a young woman in a cage, and she was screaming for help. The ringmaster opened that cage, and she ran toward the audience, pleading for us to help her. And the savage crowd was screaming in excitement. The four of us ran out of there. That place was insane. The only person who had said anything I could even understand was that poor girl... We ran for a long time, looking for my car. It wasn't that the car had moved from where we had parked it. It was just more like where we parked it had moved itself. We could see figures looking like the barbarian dogmen in the woods all around us. And, the f and all four of us had tears streaming down our cheeks from the brutal fear of the situation. My girlfriend kept shouting that she wanted to wake up. But the sad part was that we were all very much awake. When we found the car, I felt my heart jumping in my chest. I couldn't believe it when the engine turned over on the first try. I really thought we were never going to get out of there. As we all strapped in, though, we could see them emerging from the woods on three different sides of us. They were dogmen. Or maybe they were werewolves. They looked identical to the one we had seen performing inside. They had all their eyes locked on us. And I suddenly had three people screaming at me to please drive. Well, I drove. And the beasts ran after us. There were so many of them. It sounded like a herd of cattle was trailing behind us. It was very hard for me to see where I was going because I couldn't stop my eyes from tearing up and getting all blurry. But I made it back to the turnpike, screaming some incoherent battle cry that would have made Conan himself proud if he were a real person. But I don't even know what that means anymore. Real person. Of course, the next morning, we were all on the internet looking for any mention of that carnival. Then we found the phone number of the police for that area to report that woman that we had seen being held captive. Of course, the cops laughed at us, so Tom and I made a plan. We both decided to go back to the spot right away that day and film what we could under the daylight with our cell phones. If the police wouldn't help us, we'd just post the pics and videos online and alert the public that way. The girls wished us luck, and Tom and I set off driving westward on the Pennsylvania Turnpike. Well, we never found the spot where the circus had been. We realized we must have driven past it at some point, 
so we doubled back, but it wasn't anywhere to be found. We couldn't even find the clear-cut area it had been inside. It wasn't like they had packed up and left overnight. It was that the clear-cut area in the woods had never been cut clear. It made no sense, and I have no explanation for what happened to us. However, I do think that this might explain how people can see the dogman, and yet nobody can ever find the dogman. Maybe it isn't always there. Maybe the dogman's world and our world only overlap at certain times and in certain places. Maybe this is where the missing 411 people go. Maybe we were some of the only few who ever came back. Of course, this is all just guesswork on my part, and I don't really have any answers. I can't even answer the simplest of questions about any of this, such as... Did we see a dogman? Or a werewolf? The Tutal Dogman Dear Scary Stories NYC I have a story about dogmen that used to come around the house we used to use for a summer home. The thing is, my wife thinks they were Bigfoot because she never saw their faces. She couldn't because they were just so big that they were taller than our summer home's windows. The only way I can explain it is to tell it straight through like a story. So that's what I'm going to do. Mary and I had become successful after many years of hard work. With both kids off to college, we were able to find enough to get ourselves a little house, sort of in between Fife Lake and Manton in Michigan, but not exactly. It was at the edge of a woods on a hill, overlooking a small U-shaped lake. In the middle of the lake was a long, narrow shaft of land with very tall trees growing on it, looking like they had been there since the dinosaur ages. I absolutely loved the unique beauty of the place, and Mary could tolerate it. She fretted that the hill was too steep for middle-aged city dwellers like us. And she was, of course, absolutely correct, but I still found that the greatest location to build a home that I'd ever seen. Don't go looking for it. The place got wrecked by the next owner. But don't make me get ahead of myself. This all happened when the house, or a cottage, really was still standing, precariously, at the top of that steep, sandy, beachy hill. Cue the dogman. My wife Mary was inside the house one evening, making dinner, and I was down by the water alone, just staring at the waves or the trees, and feeling grateful to have this reward after decades of backbreaking labor. Suddenly I heard Mary scream, and I started climbing the sandy hill to get back up to her. What I learned then, which I hadn't before, was that the more panicked you get on that hill, the less effective your actions are. You're better off remaining calm and methodically climbing up. Doing it too fast or getting too careless will lead to you sliding right back down to where you started. So as I was being schooled by that hill, I saw two absolutely immense creatures sliding and racing down the hill in my general direction. I screamed and one of them kicked sand in my mouth, which led to me coughing badly for a long time. As the two creatures sped down past me, splashed through the water, then loudly crashed into the woods on the central part of that U-shaped lake below us. I did get a second or two of a pretty fairly clear view of both of them, as they barreled and fell down toward me, and I'll attempt to pull all the details I can from my memory for you now. First of all, these were men, and they were not small ones. They had very hairy bodies, so hairy that they could be compared with gorillas in that sense. They were big, muscular bruisers, and they could have made a fortune working for the wrestling programs on the TV. There were two strange things, which stood out immediately about them to me, though, and those two things were that their hands and feet looked like they were clawed, and that their heads were big, giant dog heads. They had pointed ears on top like a German shepherd. Imagine very dark German shepherds with bodies like muscle-bound gym rat humans. And you'd be starting to imagine what I was seeing in those seconds when I thought they were going to crush me into that sandy hill. Between the panic I'd just endured and the horrible experience of coughing sand out of my lungs and mouth, 
It took me a while to get back up the hill to Mary. When I did, I discovered the poor thing was still not doing well from the shock of her experience. She stuttered and stammered out a description of what had happened to her. She said all she could see out the two side windows of the house was two giant hairy black chests and bellies of what had to have been Bigfoot. I didn't bother to correct her. I mean, it wasn't a time for semantics and quibbling. She could call it whatever she wanted. I was just hoping she would calm down and stop hyperventilating. Things settled down after a while, and neither of us talked about leaving the location. After all, what were the chances of seeing a cryptid twice in one place? That's like lightning striking twice, right? That's what we figured, at least. In fact, it was a year and a half or two years before we saw them again. But this time I was inside the house looking out. They walked up to those same two side windows that Mary had described seeing them through the last time. It was both of them, again, standing side by side, looking at something on our roof. I can't tell you what, since both of their heads were well above the window top, and we could only see their heaving, massive chests. You could sense that each of them must have had the strength of 14 men. It was electrifying to be so close to so much raw power. Electrifying like the electric chair, I mean. Or like sticking your finger in the socket at the very least. It was terrifying, and I felt like I was buzzing all over. The only thing I can compare it to is being in battle, but even that is a little different. Like, at least battle makes sense in that you know what weapons do. You know what fighting is. I had no idea what those two giant men with dog heads even were, and that made them even more frightening than bears. I didn't know what these beasts were. I didn't know what they wanted, and I didn't even have any clue what they were looking up at on my roof either. All I knew is that they had huge pectoral muscles and that they were the tallest bipedal creatures I had ever seen. Behind me, Mary was walking into the room talking about something. I could hear when she saw the two dogmen outside because I heard her gasp and then I could hear her fall behind me. She must have fainted. I heard a sound which I thought was her head hitting something very hard. Then I turned and broke into action. That stupid couple of dogmen had caused my wife to hit her head on the way down from a faint that they also caused. She could be seriously hurt or worse, and it was because of those two beasts. I was filled with a kind of anger that gave me energy in that moment. Somehow having no trouble carrying her in my arms, I brought her out in front of the house and somehow managed to get her into the car. Years earlier, I had been unable to carry my wife over the threshold when we got married. She weighed less then, and I was in better shape, yet I couldn't do it. On this day, though, when I thought I might be about to lose her, I was somehow able to carry my wife out past those dogmen and fit her into the car. As I got into the driver's seat, I saw them peeking around to watch what I was doing. They seemed curious. I didn't care. I cursed them out and began the long, slow drive out of the woods and toward the closest hospital. Mary seemed okay and they could find no bruises on her head at the emergency room. I dropped her at a motel, then drove back to the summer home to pick up some of our belongings. When I got there, I saw Mary's plastic coffee mug on the kitchen floor and realized I must have heard that hitting something and mistook it for her skull. I felt a huge sense of relief as I packed our stuff into the back of the car. Then I climbed into the driver's seat and turned on the engine and the headlights. And there, just a few feet in front of the car, were those two massive dogmen once again. At least, I presume they were those dogmen as I couldn't see high enough to see their heads. These two beast men were just too tall. Putting the car in reverse, I turned around and drove backward the entire drive down the hill, tears filling my eyes and making it even harder to navigate in reverse. I did it, though. I had to do it. I had to get out of there and back to my wife. There just wasn't any other option. And so I did what I needed to do. But wow, was that the most horrible thing I ever experienced. To be entirely alone in the night and see both of them right there. I never felt so hopeless or so overmatched. I'm lucky they only seemed to want to scare me or something. 
Then again, if they had chased me, I wouldn't even know, since I specifically decided not to look behind me until I was on the main road again and driving forward. I know I would have lost control if I had seen them coming after me. In fact, my wife and I feel like we lost 10 years off our life from the two times we saw the two tall dogmen. Dogman versus the mugger. Dear Scary Stories NYC, I am a five foot two woman who likes to jog early in the morning before work. I started this after my boyfriend started making fat jokes about both of us. Now he jogs with me, but it's not because he cares about his weight. No, it's because I saw a dogman ambush a guy who was trying to mug me. No, I'm not kidding. I once saw a dogman at dawn on my jogging path. So let me tell you about it. First of all, I apologize in advance if I am fuzzy about when different things took place. Since the pandemic started, I have trouble remembering when things happen because it's all been one long mishmash of working from home. When I used to commute an hour each way to work five days a week, there would be events and changes that would give me the sense of time passing. Working from home, I have to tell you, I don't even seem to notice the seasons passing. So, like I said, chubby hubby here thought it would be hysterical to make a comment about the enlarging size of my derriere in front of my friends. Now, when my friends also thought his joke was a belly laugh riot, I realized that I was the only one who didn't think the idea of me getting heavy was a source for hilarity. So the next day I went shopping for a jogging outfit. And the next thing you knew, I was on Google Maps trying to decide on the prettiest jogging path near me. After jogging in a few different places, I found myself going back to the Crooked Lake Trail, which is actually a half hour drive away from me. I found it fun driving through the darkness to run in the woods as the sun rose and the forest slowly got lit up all around me. There really was a kind of a magic feel to it. I also initially enjoyed jogging alone, but that ended. On the dark morning, when I got spotted by an athletic mugger. Now when I first saw him, he looked skinny to me. I thought he looked like that comedy 50s doo-wop group from the 70s, Sha Na Na. My mother used to love them. He had pale skin, black hair, and he was wearing a wife beater that showed off his narrow, skinny shoulders. Yet somehow when he looked back at me, he did so through the eyes of a predator. And he made me feel like I had just stuck my foot in a bear trap. I sped up as I passed him, but he just watched casually as I did so. I felt paranoid, so I turned around and... Oh no, he was following me. Still, he was probably just a jogger like me. I mean, why else would he have been standing on the track when I ran past him? He must have been taking a breather, that's all. Now he was back to jogging. So what? Who cares? I glanced behind me again, and I was pretty sure that he was closing the gap between us. That made my heart beat faster, and I didn't like the feeling. Still, he was taller than I was. He had longer legs. So why shouldn't he catch up to me? In fact, he should eventually pass me. It didn't make him a bad guy. It just meant he was faster than I was. I told myself I was being silly and that everything was still perfectly fine. When I could hear the guy breathing behind me, I moved to the side, giving him room to pass me. That's when I heard a creepy voice rasp out. Hey, where you going, big legs? If we were in a social situation, that would have been strike one, two, and three right there. But we weren't in society. We were in the woods. Different rules exist outside of civilization. And in the woods, animals like Shana Na over there trump tiny ladies who went to college like myself. By the way, my apologies to the real Shana Na. I'm sure they're all very nice people. This guy, he wasn't nice. He said one rude thing after another, and when I finally got fed up and turned to slap him, he grabbed my wrist easily out of the air. He might have been skinny, 
But he was fast and strong, and above all, he was very mean. He told me to give him my money and my cards, so I gave him a knee to the groin, and I ran. I wasn't jogging that time. I was running. I wanted to put distance between me and that guy first, and then figure out what to do second. I hoped I had hit him hard enough that I could get out of his sight before he felt well enough to run after me. I turned around and looked behind to see that somehow he was limping after me already. Even limping, he was keeping pace with me. As he fell better and I got more tired and winded, he was going to catch up to me. I needed an act of God to save me. He was at least going to rob me. I didn't know what else might happen, but I was deeply scared in that moment. I did not see this leading to a happy ending, if you know what I mean. I looked around for help, but I knew there was never anyone in this spot at that hour. The sun was just beginning to break. People would start showing up soon, but soon wasn't going to be good enough. I wanted to scream, but I didn't know who would hear it, and I couldn't spare the breath it would take. So I just kept running as fast as I could and gasping to get oxygen back into my aching lungs. I was feeling dizzy and out of breath. I leaned hard into a tree and bent over, hands on my knees gasping desperately for air. I couldn't do anything else, not even think. If that mugger man had caught up then, I wouldn't have been able to do anything at all in resistance. I heard him about 30 feet behind me. He was chuckling. He was gloating and thanking me for finally slowing down. He was saying condescending things about how most ladies don't hold out as long as I did, but he was glad to see I'd come to my senses and all that sort of thing. I gathered the strength to turn my head and glare at Sir Nastiness, but when my head turned, what I saw gave me an adrenaline jump that caused me to leap up to a full standing position. I saw it all as it happened. My random turn was timed exactly right, so I could see that creep walking toward me, a big smirk on his bully boy face. He had won, and I would be his spoils. He wasn't just walking toward me, he was strutting, triumphantly. But then, in that same first second, from the creep's right and my left, now from behind some tall trees and bushes, emerged what... I would call a monster arm, in that it appeared human, but too big and entirely covered in animal fur. On top of that, the hands at the end seemed sort of weaponized, like claws almost more than hands. Then after the monster arm, out came a full-blown monster in real life. It was a tall, man-like creature, but like I was saying, he was a man covered in animal fur, if you can imagine such a thing. Or maybe he was an animal who was just shaped in many ways like a man. Not his head, though. At first I thought I was seeing a cat-headed man. But as the sighting progressed, I saw enough for me to call him some kind of a dogman. Why I say that is that the snout appeared to be more canine. And something about the eyes and ears said wolf or dog to me. The triangular-shaped ears on top of its head were probably the reason I thought I was seeing a feline head from behind. But when I saw it from a side angle, the mouth and snarl were more like a wild dog than any kind of cat I've ever seen. The monster was like one and a half times as tall as the mugger. So if the mugger was 5'11 or 6, then that upright wolf might have been 9? Is that even possible? That doesn't sound right. But the mugger's head was at the creature's chest level. Even if I say the mugger was 5'8", that still makes the wolfman taller than any guy in a costume could ever hope to be. Even wearing stilts. Which this guy wasn't. So the dogman picked the bad guy up in the air. Holding him by his shoulders so the guy's arms were held in place. But his legs were swinging wildly. He was screaming at the wolfman at first. Then he was begging him to let him go. The dog man then sort of held the guy up in the air over his head, right? And the guy was screaming and begging and kicking and pleading. And then the dog man kind of hefted the guy forward onto the road. 
The mugger landed pretty hard and clumsily, but that was his own fault. At the time, I wondered why the animal was that gentle with him, to be honest. But then I understood. In the next few seconds, that mugger got up and ran. Well, limped. In the direction I had come from. And the big old dog-headed man? Well, he kind of smiled at me. Panting, with his tongue hanging out. Then he casually dropped to all fours and started leisurely trotting after the creepy guy. The mugger kept looking over his shoulder, seeing the dog, seeing him catching up, and then that guy screeched, pathetically. I wondered how he had the lung power to run and shout at the same time. I had just learned that was too much for me. So when I told this story to my husband, I was surprised when he didn't doubt me about the dogman part. It turns out he thinks he saw a dogman when he was in college, so he never even reacted when I told him that stuff. He was much more concerned about the idea that I was jogging in the dark where strange bad guys, trying to look like Sha Na Na, were running around. He suggested I find an indoor gym to jog in, and he offered to buy me a jogging treadmill machine to keep me safe at home. But instead he was forced to start jogging along with me every morning in the dark. I told him I loved being in nature at dawn, and I feel safe and protected there. After all, I was there to witness the epic battle between Dogman versus Mugger. Why do we call him Godzilla Tim? Because we all look up to him. Just like movie Godzilla is tall, Tim's a giant among men, and that's all. Please join us to thank you one of our most important supporters and channel members, Godzilla Tim Walker. Tim has been here since the beginning of the modern era of our show, when we first evolved up from little snails. Mr. Walker is one of the only reasons we're even still on the internet here in 2023, so we are truly in his debt, and we're honored to have him as our executive producer. This week, I hope Tim is enjoying our four or five days straight featuring a new, secret and uncentered story, each day for members only. We've had the Devil Dogman, this Florida snowstorm dogman that was extra creepy. And I think tonight is the one about the werewolf lumberjacks, or is that one tomorrow? In either case, those episodes are only for our channel members and PayPal club members. That dogman had human hands. Dear Scary Stories NYC, I want you to know that I have no problem accepting the possible existence of cryptids like Bigfoot or Dogman. I am a scientifically oriented person, and I think there's enough reason for science to continue to look into these topics, which are considered on the fringe. I do not believe in the supernatural, the paranormal, or anything woo-woo. So that is why I find myself perplexed and annoyed at my continued inability to find any rational or logical explanation for the very creepy dogman sightings that I've been experiencing personally. They're having an effect on my sanity. They're introducing stress factors into my life that I have no means of coping with or adjusting to. The dogman who I've been witnessing does not seem like an undiscovered species of animal. It seems more like some kind of malignant force. I mean, if evil could take a form, I think it took the form of this dogman, and I think it shifts into and out of that form at will in order to push forward its sick and unhealthy agenda. Uh, what I mean to say is I know it can't be doing that. It would be impossible for it to be a shapeshifter. Those are imaginary, magical creatures from folklore and fiction. I'm a man living in the real world. I'm too old to believe in fairy tales. And so, of course, I don't believe in werewolves. The werewolf-like creature which has been harassing me is clearly a dogman. I'll describe it for you. This creature has the head of a wolf and the demeanor of one, too. I first saw it walking on all fours, and I was transfixed with its graceful movements. It was walking alone at the edge of a patch of trees on the outskirts of my property. It was a big wolf, but not giant. I remember its fur having a mix of black to reddish-brown colors, with gray and white on its face and snout. 
The eyes were mysterious and hard to read, but when I tried to look in them, there was an eye shine that I found distracting. Suddenly I was watching the creature standing up like a man, and I was thinking, did it always look like that? I mean, some of it was the same, like the head did not change appearance, for instance. But while I was looking in those eyes, they rose up, and when I took my eyes off them again, he was now standing up on his hind legs, and his hairy form appeared far more human than it had earlier. At first I told myself that this was just an illusion brought on by the fact that he was standing like a human being, but then I noticed something which nearly made me feel ill and caused the world to become dizzy all around me. The creature, the wolf-headed dogman, he didn't have paws. I mean, the fur ended at his wrists, and he did not have paws. Extending out past those furry wrists were human hands, or hands that looked just like human hands might, if they were sticking out of a werewolf's wrists. Again, if werewolves were real, of course, which we know they aren't, so... Therefore, that was not a werewolf. I am still trying to understand how the hands looked so human, though. The skin might have been Caucasian, or at least of a lighter hue. To be honest, when thinking back on it, in the light I saw that creature, the skin color might have been of Asian or Native American or Middle Eastern descent also. But nothing darker than Café au lait, let's say. I feel like I might be rationally discussing the racial makeup of a hallucination. This, to me, is such a confusing subject that I am not even certain which are the important parts for me to note. If this was a figment of my imagination, then my mind is breaking down, and my focus should be on restoring my sanity. If that is in fact a real creature resembling a werewolf, then I have to ask why my senses seem to keep presenting me evidence that I am seeing a werewolf and not a dogman. Why is there more evidence suggesting that he's a shape-shifting werewolf than there is suggesting that he's an undiscovered cryptid species? And then, of course, that leads us back full circle to me questioning whether I might just be insane. In which case, none of the rest of this matters in the slightest, does it? So, back to me behind my house, staring at this wolf who I could now see, was not a wolf at all. Had his body changed while I was lost in the reflections dancing off his eyes, or was it an illusion brought on by his manlike posture? As I stared into those eyes, wondering what kind of a mind was behind them staring back at me, I heard my wife scream behind me. It wasn't a scream like she was frightened, or a scream like she had just seen the Beatles score a touchdown in the World Series. It was a scream like my wife was in horrible pain. I turned around, but I couldn't see her anywhere, looking back at the upright canine. I saw that he had taken the opportunity of my turning around to look for my wife to make good his escape. I don't know where he ran off to, but he was no longer there. Racing all the way back to the house... I couldn't find my wife in there anywhere. Looking out in the driveway and seeing her car missing, I remembered that she had driven into town. I called her on her cell phone anyway just to make sure she was okay, and she was. So who had screamed? Apparently, nobody had. So if the scream was imagined by me, how much of the rest of the scene had also been a product of my imagination? I had a dream for three nights in a row that the dogman was in my bedroom, staring at my wife as she slept next to me. It was a horrible nightmare, and I'd wake up each time, flailing and trying to get him out of my room. It was beginning to concern my wife, and I couldn't really blame her. The thing was, she didn't seem to really believe me that the dogman was even a thing. She didn't seem to think it was real. That was very disheartening for me, that I could tell she didn't believe me about what I had said I was experiencing. One night, I woke up to hear someone messing with the bedroom window on my wife's side of the room. I opened my eyes and looked over, and was stunned to see that the dogman 
was up on the roof and outside that second story window. He was trying to jiggle the window from the outside to get the lock to unlock itself. Amazingly, it did seem to be turning in the way he wanted it to. And I realized he was going to succeed in opening that window. It was on my wife's side of the bed. He was coming in to stare at my wife, the same as in my recurring dreams. I screamed to him to get away, and he seemed surprised that I was awake. I saw him turn and leap off the roof just as my wife woke up and looked to see me yelling at absolutely nothing outside the window. There were other incidents similar to this, and our marriage was over faster than I would have thought possible. Love can turn sour so quickly if you're being tormented by... Well, was I really being tormented by that thing? Or was that thing a manifestation of my own inner torment, as my wife's lawyer stated at the divorce hearings? The divorce established that I was insane, and that somehow my being insane was mental cruelty to my wife and now she's my ex-wife since she is close friends with my boss's wife i got fired from my job because they said i was an abuser my boss apologized to me he said he had to do it or he'd be in the doghouse with the missus the doghouse get it very punny my life became a joke about as funny as that joke i held on to the house for a while using some savings from my former life when I was employable. During that time, I set out to record the doings of the Dogman in some way. I tried both audio and video recordings, and I made a bunch of what I hoped might become YouTube videos for a new channel. I figured either I would get proof of this thing, and then people would know I wasn't crazy, or maybe the video camera would scare the Dogman off, if it really is as camera shy as people say. So... Of course, the dogman never came around when I had the camera on. But he didn't stop coming around. And in fact, his harassment of me got creepier and creepier. He proved to me that he no longer had any trouble at all getting into my house. And that he could do it at will. It was a nightmare, just a nightmare. One night I got up in the middle of the night. And I walked down the hall to the bathroom in the dark. When I got in the bathroom and flipped on the lights, the werewolf was in my bathroom shower. I don't mean he was looking in the window into the bathroom. I mean the creature was physically in my bathroom shower. I screamed, and then I realized I no longer needed to use that toilet. Running back to my room, the creature chased me and grabbed at my pajama top. He tore the edge of it, which was my first physical proof that he exists. I got in my room and locked it before the beast man could get in. But I knew I wasn't safe. I could hear him outside the door, making this giggling sound. Something like a laughing hyena might make. It sounded like he was making fun of me. It was driving me nuts, being laughed at in that way, inside my own home. I suppose I'm lucky that the beast never seemed to make a mess when he came in. And he would let himself out the same way he got in although I never discovered either. Well, I lost the house and I moved into a small apartment in a large building. I got lucky again in that I hit it off with a neighbor and she found some good paying work for me. Soon she and I got to be close and I could tell that something was bothering her. This was about three months after I moved in there. I had never told her about my dogman situation so I was pretty stunned when she told me that there was a man in a monster costume who was outside her window the previous night. She and I lived two dozen floors above the sidewalk in an urban neighborhood. I don't know how any living thing, human or otherwise, could cling to the sheer surface of our building in order to be trying to break into our windows so high up in the sky. I asked her to please explain to me more clearly what she meant when she said it was a man in a monster costume. She told me that at first, she thought she was seeing a werewolf trying to break into her room through the window. But then she could clearly see his light-skinned human hands sticking out from the ends of the fur costume. 
She saw a dog-headed furry creature with human hands outside her window, high in the sky, in the middle of the night. All of the evidence continues to mount that this is not an undiscovered cryptid species which is haunting my life. This is an intelligence of a variety that I have never experienced before. I mean, this is how I feel when my stress forces me to fantasize. I know there are no werewolf men who climb buildings to harass your woman just to drive you insane. I know werewolves don't exist. I know werewolves can't possibly harm you. I just wish someone would tell that to my werewolf. <laughs> The Gugway Dogman trashed my house. Dear Scary Stories NYC, I have a story for you that I didn't need to make up because it happened to me. It's about a kind of a dogman that I don't think you know about in New York City. We over here in the middle of the country call it a Gugway. I don't know where the name comes from, but it means a dogman that's also like a Bigfoot in some ways. Now the Gugways are not the nice dogmen. They are the kind of dogmen that you call nasty things. I've never known anyone who had to deal with one of these that didn't have a foul-worded nickname for that sucker. In fact, some of the most colorful monster encrypted names I've ever heard were being applied to the Gugway dogman. To keep it PG rated, I'll just say the Gugway is not a very nice fellow. In fact, he's kind of a jerk. You know, I once had a chance to talk to this self-help guru kind of guy. It was just random while we both rode a train somewhere once. I told him about the Gugway taking years out of my life. And he told me in return that the Gugway was my greatest teacher. He said the Gugway taught me that life was not what I thought it was. Life was something else entirely. And now I can see that. Other people are still living in illusion, but I've had that illusion stripped away. And the fact that I can now see how ugly life is, why, that's something I can thank the Gugway for. I know the self-help guy was trying to get me to forgive and to move on, but his teaching only made me loathe that dogman even more deeply than ever before. Let me tell you what that creature did to me. Then maybe you'll understand why. I remember years back when I bought my first home. It was completely destroyed less than a month after I moved in, along with my life. My wife left me, I went broke, I lost my job, and I had to spend years climbing out of debt before I could make one single friend again. Now I know what people are really like, and I'll never trust anyone ever again, not as far as I can throw them. I realize what a joke love is, and everything else about the human race too. But it wasn't a human that destroyed my house, and put me in a hole it took 12 years to climb out of. No, it was a dirty, no good, filthy dogman who destroyed my life. A dogman that I will never be able to find, never be able to get even with. Here's how it all went down. Maybe you can pick out a lesson, or a moral, to tack on to the end of this to make it feel like it made sense or was worth it. To me, this is just the story of my life being ruined, and my ability to tolerate humans being eliminated by Satan's personal creation, the damned and demonic Dogman. My house back then was located by a swamp in southern Michigan, just barely north of Indiana. I loved it because it was the most land for the least cost. My wife hated it because it was the most land for the least cost. She knew I got it at a bargain price and she was not a bargain shopping kind of a woman. To be honest, I don't see how she and I could have ever lasted even if my gravy train hadn't gotten cut off because she would have always wanted more and more and more. She was all about her looks. But she knew she had a limited amount of time to get rich from those looks before they stopped getting her what she wanted. You know, I thought we were in love. 
which shows you that I've never been as smart as I thought I was. Now, the reason she left me was because of that Gugwe dogman, although she blames it on me. What happened was she caught me outside at night, firing on that nasty beast as it tried to get close to our house. Man, she blew up. It was all this nonsense about how I had promised her I wouldn't bring my weapon to the new house. I never said anything like that. I'm not going to let some woman tell me I can't defend myself. And when I saw there was a big dog-headed squatch messing around, I felt it was important to send him a clear message. That message was that this was my land. She was my wife. And that I would be willing to kill him. To defend both or either. Well, my wife screamed and slapped at me because I defended her from that monster. I'm pretty sure he saw all of that from somewhere out in the forest that night. I'm also sure he heard the woman I love making fun of me for caring about her. And I'm almost positive he must have seen her driving off to her mother's house, leaving me alone. Once she was gone, that hideous dog thing started coming around the house to bother me, just for fun. He and I agreed about one thing. I was the biggest loser on the planet. Sometimes he'd pelt the house with stones and it would distract me from my work. Sometimes he'd ring the doorbell and run away on his giant Bigfoot feet. I decided to drive out to my wife's mother's house and try one more time for a reconciliation. The first day things actually went all right, so her mom invited me to sleep over. We got into a fight over breakfast the next morning, though, and that was the real end of our relationship, for good and permanent. I drove back to the house, eager to fix it up and try to resell it. No sense in keeping a place that large if I wasn't going to be raising a family anymore. When I got back home, though, the entire house was trashed, and I mean completely gutted. I knew it was done by that dogman, too, because... It was in his style. Just about the only thing that belonged to my wife that was still left in that house after she moved out was a bunch of flowers that she had stuck in a vase. Now they were all dead, and whoever had torn the entire ground floor of my house to shreds took the trouble of laying my wife's dead roses and flowers on top of the destruction. This was like a dogman art statement. The house was now as utterly wrecked as my marriage. So, the dogman's message was a bit of a blunt one, but I had a blunt marriage. I did see the dogman one more time, and it was the last time I was driving away from that place. He ambushed me, running out on the road as I was accelerating. I swerved to avoid hitting him and nearly spun out into a tree. The only reason I didn't is that I guess it was just time for my luck to change. I mean, what else but luck could explain that I spun out, did a full 360, then sort of ended up back in my own lane and heading in the right direction. It was a non-accident, or a non-event, but I bet there are other timelines in which I didn't even survive that incident. I'm working, and I'm paying bills, and I'm trying to stay healthy, so I don't suppose I have any real right to complain. But I sometimes wish I could go back in time, and pick out a different place to move my wife into. Maybe she and I could have stayed married if it hadn't been for that nasty bully of an animal man. But time doesn't flow backward, only forward. I've got to accept that our marriage was over long before. The Gugwe Dogman trashed my house. Todd Graves is one who's generous and kind. His giving and sharing is hard to outshine. Two years of being part of the channel. He's made a mark that can't be unraveled. Please help me in thanking Todd Graves for being a channel member for two straight years. In exchange, Todd gets to see our secret uncensored Dogman stories, such as the new one coming this Sunday, called Dogman Ate My... Well, I shouldn't even say the title on this channel. That sleepy old dog man. Dear Scary Stories NYC, I grew up in Iowa, and we had a dog man over there. He was a nice old sleepy dog man, and he never bothered anybody, so nobody bothered him either. Before you go telling me that dog men don't exist in Iowa, 
Go look at a map. See how it borders up on Wisconsin like that? Well, I live on the East Coast now for business reasons, but my family still lives back in that area near the Yellow River State Forest, where they're trying to keep our family farm going on into the future. I have kin in the Evergreen Cemetery over there, and I once saw the dogman in that cemetery, so I'll start off telling you about that time. I was a teenager, but a young one. And I was out with some kids that I knew were troublemakers, but I wanted to be friends with anyway. They all tricked me into walking through the cemetery where they had seen the old dog man sleeping earlier. I was dared to walk from the front of the place back to a certain gravestone toward the back. And I didn't know they had chosen that path so that I would trip right over that dog man in the dark. Well, I very nearly did that, but just at the last second... My eyes and brain combined to let me know that some kind of large animal body was laying in the grass up ahead of me. I stopped short, and in the process, I accidentally kicked some dirt up onto that animal in front of me. That mound of breathing fur rose up, and up, and up, over my head, until I was looking straight up at the face of our local dogman. I was freaking out. I didn't know if I should stand still or run away. The dogman yawned slowly, showing me every detail of the inside of his mouth from a few different angles, including some nice views of his pointed, sharp teeth, each of them as long as one of my fingers, as it pumped the worst dog breath in history down into my breathing space, then drooled on top of my head to finish its yawn. I screamed and ran just the same as if it had roared at me. When I made it back to my so-called friends, I looked over my shoulder to see the dogman lying back down and going back to sleep already. You know, that was both the scariest and mellowest carnivore that I ever met. I already knew him long before that incident. The dogman, I mean. I knew he wouldn't go out of his way to bother us humans. But I also had been told to make sure not to agitate him, even by accident. My father used me one year as an advanced dogman scout for him, because the creature had taken to falling asleep in the field on the farm and being nearly undetectable until you were right up on him. Just the same as what had happened to me in the cemetery. In fact, if I hadn't been working for my dad on the farm earlier, I might have gone ahead and fallen right on top of that dogman in the cemetery later on. But with that dogman around for my entire childhood, I grew up wary of everything around me. Sort of like a friend in college told me his community became once they got invaded by some dangerous snakes that like to hide inside human communities. I mean, none of us had been harmed by the dogman, but he was so big and his teeth and claws were dangerous weapons. He might crush someone to death just by rolling over in his sleep if you know what I mean. It wouldn't even have to have been on purpose. So I remember one harvest season I was scouting out ahead of the thresher that Dad was using to harvest the field of grain that year. I saw the dogman up ahead, sleeping in between the plants. As I was raising my arms to signal my dad, the dogman woke up from the sound of the approaching machinery. It stood up to its full height and looked over at my dad, who was turning off the machine. Dad didn't say anything, and the two of them just sort of stared at each other for a while. Then the big old hairy dogman kind of turned and sleepily walked over to the edge of the field further down. I thought he was going to leave, but then he flopped down between some grain stalks and went right back to sleep. Dad ended up leaving that corner unharvested, and we called it Dogman's Crib, until it got too cold out there for even a dogman to sleep in that vegetation. I mean, I don't know if he ever came back to that spot after that day, but Dad left it up for the rest of the season just to be respectful of that dogman who clearly needed to get his beauty rest. I always wondered where the sleepy old monster would go when it got below freezing, but one year my friend at school, Ernie, told me that his family had to get these retired animal wranglers to come over and coax the big beast out of their basement. At first they tried luring him with 
milk bone dog biscuits. But when that didn't work, they cooked up some Jimmy Dean pork snossages and laid them out in a row, leading the critter up the stairs and then out to the backyard. I told that story to someone I know in New York City, and they got all jerky about it. They said, Picks or it didn't happen, which is such an ignorant thing to say. You know, Ernie and his family weren't concerned with posting images to Insta crap back then. They were wondering if that dog man had crapped or peed in their basement. They weren't notifying their friends of the gossip. They had to go down there and clean it up fast before things got even worse. They also had to locate the way he got in and fix that, which they couldn't. There didn't seem to be any way something that large could have gotten in, and none of the basement windows were broken either. They called in a guy to compare the basement to the blueprints of the house and explain to them what happened, but he came away insisting that there was no way a bear-sized dog got into that basement unless the people living there let him in. My friend told me that they were keeping film in a camera because if that dog man got in again, they were going to want photos to shut up their critics and doubters. Well, I didn't doubt him. That sounded like exactly something that dog man would have gotten himself up into. I was a teenager the last time I saw that dog man myself. I was with some rowdy buddies of mine and I was driving us around places where grown-up serious people wouldn't bother us. We ended up going over by 210th Street to the east of town and taking the Rumble Bridge over the train tracks. If you're not from around that part of Iowa, you might not know about this bridge that was so poorly paved, it felt like you were riding on the railroad tracks themselves, not up in the air going over them. So even though my friends wanted me to take the bridge fast, my father told me he once lost a muffler on that bridge, so I took it as slowly as possible. And while we were rolling slowly over that bridge, one of my buds in the back seat perked up and said, Hey, there's that sleepy old dog man down below. We all looked, and sure enough, that dog man was asleep on the railroad tracks. Sooner or later, a train was going to come along, and I didn't know if that would be the end of that big old monster or the end of that train and all the people in it. I put the car in neutral and told the guys to wake that dog man up. They got out and started shouting and throwing little pebbles they found on the bridge until the dogman finally woke up and looked at them. They cheered and shouted at him a little more, but he just seemed to think they were crazy, and he laid his head back down to go to sleep again. Then I started beeping the horn and all four of us screamed our heads off until the dogman finally got up, shook himself all over, yawned, and licked his chops. Then, as we watched, he walked over maybe 10 or 12 feet from the edge of the train tracks, and he laid right back down to go back to sleep again. We were like, well, at least he isn't on the train tracks anymore, and we departed, congratulating each other for our sense of civic duty. Of course, none of our heroism mattered later on when our parents got mad at us for staying out after curfew, but that's the way the world was in those days. And as tough as we thought we had it back then, it was a lot better than I think the kids have it these days. I wouldn't trade places with those poor guys for a trillion dollars. All this generation has is scary and evil monster dogmen. But back in my day, we all knew and loved. That sleepy old dogman. Mary Shabazz goes first class, top tier channel member. And don't you know, we thank her so from January through December. Please join us in thanking top tier channel member Mary Shabazz for rejoining the channel after a brief time off. We certainly missed her and it's a happy day to welcome her back. We hope Mary is enjoying the four or five days in a row of secret episodes that we've been dropping. I still haven't finished Friday, so that might be late night or something, but we'll get it out once it's finished. And we hope you're there with such a lovely people as Mary Shabazz to see all of these new secret shows. Happy Valentine's Day and welcome to our Valentine's Day Dogman Stories. You know, a lot of the emails I get sent are too short for me to figure out how to get an episode out of them or even a half or a third of an episode. 
A lot of them go in the romance folder, as there are a number of writers presenting as female who claim to have had relationships with people who they say transform into werewolves. Whether this happens to them in their real lives or in their romantic fantasies I can't tell you, but they claim these things to have been events that happened to them IRL. Well, I'm not going to call them liars. Are you? So this episode is going to be a collection of our shorter email submissions adapted by me for the show. And the range of subjects in these emails goes from one story of befriending a brave and sweet dogman to accounts of werewolves both friendly and otherwise. We also have this story I think we should start off with. It does take place on Valentine's Day. At least the big climax scene does. So let's call it... I am the Valentine's Day Dogman. Dear Scary Stories NYC, I used to be a kind of a wallflower, and women were not as attracted to me as I might have liked. I mean, I did have some girlfriends, but none of them stuck around more than four or five months before finding another guy they liked better. I wasn't considered ugly, so I could get some positive results when asking women out. It was just that I could never develop it into a closer relationship through what I now see looking back on it as personality deficiencies. I started hanging with a guy who hung with a pack of genuine werewolves. And that was when my life started to mutate and change. My friend, let's call him Bud, was hanging with those wolfmen for a full year before he let me know about it. And he was clear when he did that he wanted me to try to get accepted by the pack. He felt that if I were around guys like that, I'd naturally by osmosis pick up on how to be more interesting to the opposite sex. He told me that the reputation of these werewolves was legendary and that they could woo any woman, even those who you would think would find these kind of men sickening in every manner. Especially those kinds of women. Find a way to fit in with this guy's werewolf bros, according to Bud, and I'd be on the road to finding true happiness in a relationship. Now, as it turned out, Bud took me to meet his werewolf friends on a night when they were feeling particularly frisky. They accepted me all right, but as the butt of their jokes, I got hazed all night, and then I got held down and bitten by too many of them for me to count. And afterward, Bud had to drive me to the hospital, which was over an hour away. By the time he got me there, though, I felt fine. The doctors and nurses were stunned as they removed my red, stained, ruined clothing to discover that I did not have a single wound on my body underneath those clothes. I walked out of there under my own power, wearing my bloody jeans, and an oversized t-shirt with the logo of the hospital on it. It seemed to have been made for pregnant ladies, but I'm not sure. I just knew that I never felt so energized before when I had thought I was going to croak just an hour earlier. I thought it was the sense of relief that the attack on me had been faked. You know, that was how my mind explained the sudden healing of all those wounds. I decided that the guys had poured fake blood all over me, and that I had only thought that I was being bitten by them. Somehow, I figured it was all staged, like guar, and I felt so alive, knowing that everything was fine after all. When Bud and I stepped outside under the moon, though, I felt instantly different. I started to change. I'm not going to say that I transformed into a werewolf that night, because it didn't fully happen. But enough started to happen that Bud blurted out, Oh my God, you're becoming one of them. It was obvious to him what was happening, even if this was only a foreshock of what was to come. The first time I truly became a werewolf was on Valentine's Day, or night rather. I don't remember the year, but I definitely remember that it was Valentine's Day. And it was my third date with a girl I'm going to call Rhonda. We had a lot of fun on our first two dates, but on the third, Rhonda wanted to go for a walk in the woods at sunset, and I thought that was kind of weird, and it made me nervous. 
I wanted to be indoors because the werewolf thing happened to me far less in the early days when I stayed indoors. That isn't true anymore, but in either case, Rhonda dragged me out under the moon, which she told me was romantic. It wasn't romantic to me. I looked up in terror at it, and sure enough, I could feel its rays beginning to have an effect on me. I was going to lose my girlfriend. I was maybe even going to eat her alive. This was the worst thing that could happen, and it was happening. In front of Rhonda, for the first time, I burst fully into my hairy, monstrous werewolf form in all its vicious and animalistic glory. I looked around for the woman, whose name was already fading from my mind. I knew that if she ran, I would chase. I wanted prey to chase. I wanted something living to eat. I was the werewolf, and through animal eyes, I looked to my right, and I saw the human female. She had changed. Her eyes glowed an amber hue. She was not prey. Not at all. She was like me. She took hold of me and I understood that we were to be mated. And so it was, on Valentine's Day night, that we joined together in both forms, as male and female, husband and wife. And ever since our storybook marriage, I've gone back to being a wallflower. Sure, now I've got a beautiful wife, but she bosses me and the kids around. You can't argue with her. Have you ever tried arguing with a mother werewolf? My advice is, don't. You're not gonna win. And you'd be surprised how much you can lose. And I should know. Because... I am the Valentine's Day Dogman. The Blue Black Country Music Dogman. Dear Scary Stories NYC, I just want to drop you a short note to say that you are dead right about the dogmen in show business. I worked as a roadie for years, and I toured with a country act some time ago who had a full-on werewolf protecting this one young female singer. She was very sweet and nice to all of us, no matter what job we performed or how bad we smelled after a hard day of physical labor. But you always had to kind of talk to her from sort of across the room since she had a blue-black canine at her side at all times. He had no problem suddenly standing up on his hind legs and towering over you if he felt concerned that you might be getting out of line. This was not a literal werewolf. This was an animal. When it sat down, it did so like a dog does it. He looked big even that way, but didn't seem giant or abnormally large. Once he sprang up on his hind legs, though, his ears could sometimes scrape the ceiling. It's a little hard to describe his appearance, since it depended on whether he was acting like a dog or like a human. When sitting or lying down, he looked to me like an all-black Dalmatian. But once he sprang to his hind legs, it was shocking to see how human he looked. His shoulders were broad and muscular, and I could not see where those muscles went when he was down in a more canine position. It really was confusing, but it was not an optical effect or anything like that. This wasn't that long ago, but it was too long ago to be talking about anything that sophisticated. He wasn't a holographic projection, unless they smell like large furry animals. No, he was a real creature, but don't ask me what species he belonged to. One time we played an older venue, and he walked around with cobwebs all over the top of his too tall head. When next to the singer he protected, however, he had a habit of kneeling or squatting to remain at her eye level, or beneath it, in submissive service. In return, she'd groom the icky spiderwebs and whatnot off the top of his canine cranium. His loyalty to the young woman was unswerving, and the bond between the two of them seemed unbreakable. Anyway, this was quite a while back, and I know the singer in question got married, 
I think she's retired or semi-retired these days. If I ever hear about her doing a comeback album, or some kind of a reunion tour or something like that, my first question is going to be whether or not she'll be bringing back the Blue Black Country Music Dogman. Dogman, the silent movie mongrel. Dear Scary Stories NYC, My great-grandma was an actress in about a dozen old silent movies, and I think six or seven of them still survive. They were produced by the man she would retire from the business to marry, and the scuttlebutt in our family is that this Hollywood producer was a literal werewolf. Let me tell you the family rumor while stressing that I don't know if any or all of this is factual. I just know that it's a story that survived 100 years now, literally. So here's how it goes. Great Grandma, who I'm going to call GG from here on, was born in the area of Hollywood and was a local when the film business started moving out there from New York City during the silent movie era. She was literally working as a waitress in a diner when she got spotted and invited in to do a screen test. She hit it off with every man there by her own admission and very quickly got signed to a contract as a bit player gg fell in love or at least fell in bed with one of the big money men at the company she worked for and soon he took her away from her life of glamour and adoring fans to his life of organized crime on a level unlike that which had been seen up to that time Grandma and Mom both told me that Great Grandma hated her new life. Yes, she was cooking dinner for important politicians and show business people. She was socializing with some of the most powerful individuals of the early 20th century, but they were all like her husband. No, I don't mean gangsters. I mean, they were all werewolves. Many of them in those days attended church on Sunday in order to pretend publicly to be decent people. What wasn't known about the elites in those days, but which my grandmother was forced to confront directly, was that they held secret blood rites and orgies, in which innocent lives were lost in a pagan riot of horror and perversion. She was forced to witness one of these degenerate ceremonies, but she became physically ill, and so was never invited back. In these ceremonies, Gigi claimed that they became werewolves. Gigi always insisted that her parting with her first husband was amicable. He left her a small chunk of change, which she referred to as her dowry for her second husband. Since she was still young, she did remarry, and she became the matriarch of my family. The movie Mongrel remarried also, and had a son very quickly with the second wife. The thing is, that child looked far more like my great-grandmother than she did like that man's second wife. I have not been able to look up what happened to her online, but I wonder if her offspring are big shots in the business. And I wonder if we did a DNA test, if we would find out that we were related or not. Maybe we'd all be only six degrees of separation from... Dogman, the silent movie mongrel. Could our baby be born a werewolf? Dear Scary Stories NYC, My wife and I are expecting our first child, and my mother decided to tell me this old family story, so now we're concerned. Apparently, it's possible that my family carries lycanthropy as a recessive trait. Translated into normal English, that means that there might be a chance that any children I have might carry the trait and be born a werewolf. We have no idea how to find a doctor who knows about werewolfism, let alone believes that it could be real. So we don't know what to do. In the meantime... We're trying to find out as much as we can about my family's history. If we can debunk or disprove this narrative, that would actually be a great relief. While I have nothing against Eddie Munster, I had never planned on raising a little wolfman. If the narrative or family legend 
proves to be airtight legally, we might hire someone to write a book on the subject and try to option it as either a documentary or a dramatic adaptation. In the meantime, what I can tell you is this. Way back in the late 1800s and the early 1900s, in the days of Gallagher and Sheen, back when the Three Stooges performed on stage under the name Ted Healy and his Southern Gentlemen, there was an important booker and programmer in the Midwest who most certainly was not always human. He spent part of his time as a werewolf, and he wasn't too shy to brag about it either. Not privately. Not to his underlings, at least. One newspaper man is supposed to have joked a bit too openly about the important man's werewolfism in print, and that was the end of that guy's gossip column, as well as his life. You don't mess around with mobsters, and you don't mess around with werewolves, so why did that guy think he could make jokes about a werewolf mobster? The thing is, my ancestor got pregnant while on tour, and she had to leave. She quickly married her boyfriend from back home, but it seems impossible that he could have been the actual father. She had been performing in vaudeville as a singer, and had performed at three different venues in the Midwest, in which the notorious werewolf promoter I've been discussing had a stake in the ownership. She would have been working for the werewolf, performing at his venues, when she got pregnant. This is one of the reasons that guy was called notorious, you know. He was supposed to have fathered half the next generation of show business, while never taking responsibility for the raising of any of them. I do suppose that eventually, we will have the DNA information we need to answer all of my questions. But I am enjoying watching as the new information comes out and adds to what we already know. Did one of my ancestors become impregnated by a real-life show business werewolf? And if so... Could our baby be born a werewolf? The dogman had a crush on my wife. Dear Scary Stories NYC, my wife and I had an experience with a dogman. It was absolutely terrifying for both of us, but it was also incredibly strange and sort of unsettling too. I don't think the creature meant to frighten us, which is the weirdest part of all of this. My wife's sister, who I refuse to call my sister-in-law, thinks this is a comedy story. She says you should use it on your Valentine's Day episode because it's when my wife met a male who really appreciates her, unlike me. I'm done talking about my wife's sister, but I've only started talking about the dogman. So this is not a Valentine's story at all, since it happened in December, not February. My wife, who I will call my wife, to remind her sister that she chose to be related to me, so therefore I should be respected. Anyway, my wife and I had been chopping down a fir tree alongside the highway to bring home with us and use as a Christmas tree that year. We were carrying it back to the car to strap it on top when this really, really, really tall fur-covered animal came out of the woods across the highway from us. It looked like a wolf head on top of a super tall bear, standing upright on legs far too tall for a bear. It was orange, kind of like some foxes I've seen, and it moved in a weird slinky way, sort of like a ferret. But this was a giant creature, like 10 feet tall minimum. It looked very skinny, but it was way taller than a person, and those legs looked long and muscular enough that I bet it could probably run faster than I could. The weirdest thing about this upright beast man or dog man was that he was carrying a big, heart-shaped, metal tree ornament in front of him. It was like he wanted to put it on our Christmas tree or something. He had this shy posture with his head shrunk down into his shoulders and this timid look on his face. He walked all the way around to behind us, and I'm telling you, my heart was beating out of my chest. If that thing decided to eat us alive, 
Then we were already eaten alive. It was too big to consider fighting, and each one of its teeth and claws was a better weapon than I had on me at that moment. The huge, thin dogman got down on one knee on the side of my wife and held out the Christmas tree ornament to her. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. In my mind, I was already wondering how we were going to tie that Christmas tree to our roof with a giant dogman right there. But my wife blew past all of that. She dropped her end of the tree and slapped that heart-shaped ornament out of that dogman's hand. He flew off into the snow somewhere. While he turned to watch it fly, my wife jumped into the car, cursing in me to get the blanking Dotson back on the blanking road. I know better than to argue when my wife starts cursing. So I dropped the tree we had gone through so much trouble cutting down, and I slammed my foot down on the gas while I was still climbing back into the car. I never had time to look in the rear view and see the expression of that dogman as we drove off without his Christmas tree ornament, or our Christmas tree. Even though I think she was kind of rough on the poor dogman, I am glad my wife rejected his advances. I mean, she is my wife after all. As long as she has no return interest for that dogman, I think it's sort of sweet that... The dogman had a crush on my wife. Valerie and Nicole were both so kind, their generosity is hard to find. Generosity, kindness, and real soul, that's Valerie Gomez and Nicole. Please join us in thanking Valerie Gomez, aka Nicole Gomez, for being channel members. We hope they've been enjoying all the Secret Uncensored episodes we dropped in the last week, with a new one coming this and each Sunday after. This next person approached us in our comment section about his story but ended up deciding to only allow us to use his first name. This is a particularly scary story not for younger viewers, and we call it, I saw a dogman chase my counselor into the water. Dear Scary Stories NYC, my name is Jay, and I have a 1980s dogman encounter that happened to me personally. It was 1988, and I'm 44 now, so obviously this happened when I was a kid. It did not happen in the Midwest, in Pennsylvania, or in Louisiana, as most dogman and werewolf stories seem to. This all occurred while I was at summer camp here in California, in the Sierra Nevada mountains. What I'm about to share with you is a 100% true encounter with a dogman that was in no way friendly toward humans. This story did not have a happy ending either. The event gave me PTSD since then to now, and I'm still on medication for reasons which I trace back to this horrific encounter. If you want a story of a dogman that can tolerate humanity, then this is not the one for you. Nevertheless, this is true how I remember it, so if you want a bit of reality, then strap in and let's go. One day I got the chance to go out on a rowboat with two other guys and our camp counselor, who was going to teach us how to row and handle the boat. We had never gotten to do that before, and so it was actually really exciting for us at that age. We were having a blast learning how to operate the rowboat. Each of us boys got a chance to learn. It was a really fun time that I probably would have forgotten about years ago if it weren't for what was about to happen next. One of the boys asked our counselor if we could go across the lake to where all of the huge cedar trees were. He agreed, and we headed toward the other side. When we finally made it to the shore, we docked the boat, and our counselor told us to stay put and not leave that area by the boat. When we asked why, he told us that he had to relieve himself, and that he would be right back. Then he ran into the cedar trees and disappeared from our view. So we were having a pretty good time as we were throwing rocks over the boat and into the lake. I remember how thick the forest was around us. It was so thick that the trees blocked out the sun. And it was pretty dark there, even on that sunny afternoon. It was kind of a little creepier than I think any of us had expected before we rode over to that place. The longer the counselor was gone, the more uncomfortable I began to feel. I remember starting to be a little scared 
as we were looking into the tree line. Then we heard our counselor screaming and shouting. He sounded like he was in pain. When we heard that, we jumped back into the boat, although I don't know what we were planning on doing next. We watched our counselor run out of the woods toward our boat, and for a second, I felt both a sense of relief that he was returning and a growing fear because of the horrified look on his face and the fact that he was racing toward us at his top speed. It turned to pure fear when a creature burst out of the woods behind him. Now we could see what he was trying to get away from, and this is where we get to the source of my worst childhood trauma. This is the part that's hardest for me to talk about, but it's also the part I most need to get off my chest. If you have children in the room, maybe listen to the rest of this later. Remember, this was a pretty horrible thing for a kid to have to see, or even to hear about. So what was running very closely behind our counselor was what looked like what we would now call a dogman, or a werewolf. It was much larger than any human. Judging purely by my memory, I would guess the creature was about 11 feet tall as he was about twice the height of our counselor. It was a nightmare image. For me, personally, it still is an image from a waking nightmare, one that continues to torment me to this day. Our counselor did not reach the boat in time. The huge, fast, upright running canine tackled the poor man down into the water. I remember looking up at the creature when it was only two feet from our boat causing waves that rocked us up and down and to every side. That was the moment we were so close that we could smell it. The werewolf was thrashing our counselor around in the water. After the first few seconds, I couldn't even see him through the splashing and the foam. But each time he came up for air, we could hear him. The dogman slash werewolf did not look at us. I guess probably because it was too focused on doing what it was doing to our poor counselor. All of us boys were crying, but one of us grabbed an oar. I grabbed the other one, and then we started to row the boat away from the scene. As the third guy screamed to us that we had to save the counselor, I figured that our counselor was a goner, because we could not hear him screaming anymore as we were rowing away. I was convinced that we were all going to be next. So I rode and rode, and I tried not to look toward that monster any longer. The other two told me they saw the creature dragging our counselor back into the woods, and I felt a little ashamed to be happy that the creature was not coming after us. When we got back to the side of the lake that our camp was on, all three of us got out of the boat crying and screaming for help. We got the attention of a few camp staff, and they came running to us. I remember that everything that happened came spilling out through the tears. I told them that a werewolf killed our counselor. I was too young to know that I probably should have lied about that part. But I guess the things that happened next taught me about that. The counselors called the authorities, and when they arrived a few hours later, a search party was formed from rangers and the sheriff, or whoever they were, in their uniforms. They went across the lake to see if our counselor was still alive. An old guy in a suit took each of us boys aside and began to ask us questions about what happened. Actually, I guess he was probably the same age I am now, but to me as a kid, he seemed old. The suited man never told us his name or what his job was. All he did was tell us we were safe now and that he was one of the good guys. I don't know if he was from a local authority or a federal one or what. He asked us each to describe in full detail what the animal we saw looked like and what it sounded like. I told him that it did not make one sound while it was attacking the counselor and the others told me they both said the same thing to him. After all of the questions, the man told us to never tell anybody what happened, not even our family or parents. He never tried to tell us that we were mistaken. He never said it didn't happen. He didn't even try to tell us that what we saw was a bear. He kind of implied that, yup, we saw what we saw, but for some reason he never explained 
We would get in trouble if we talked about it. It didn't make sense to me to get in trouble for telling the truth, but I did what adults told me when I was that age. Then the man in the suit left the camp while the sheriffs and rangers were still searching for the counselor's body. When I think back on this story from the 21st century, I'm kind of stunned that all of us weren't immediately sent home and given grief counseling and so forth. No, this was the late 80s, so we were just expected to go back to camp and act as though things were normal. For the remainder of my time at summer camp that year, I was terrified, and I did not speak. Even after I got home, I was still in too much shock to talk. I think it lasted for almost three months. My parents took me to several different kinds of doctors to no effect. I did not say a single word to anybody until later that year. I think it just needed to take its time to wear off. Once I was talking and back to school in the fall, my mom took me aside and asked me privately to tell her what happened back at camp. Apparently the owners of that place had either never informed her of anything, or guess she might not have trusted the answers she was given by them. It was pretty obvious that I had been traumatized, and being a good mother she wanted to know the truth. I was a kid though, and I was afraid to get in trouble from that man in the suit. He had told me not to let anyone know about the dogman, so I lied to my own mother and I told her that a very large bear broke into our cabin while at camp. She seemed to believe my story, so she never brought the topic up again. To this day, I have never said anything about what I saw that day while at the summer camp. You are the only person that I've ever told this encounter to. Thank you for reading this, and please feel free to share this encounter on your channel. I have been listening to your Dogman stories for two years now and I've only missed a few. My real name is Jay, and... I saw a dogman chase my counselor into the water. Efren Kalunga sates our hunger in both good and bad weather. Donations from Efren by Neo Sinefren and help us to feel all better. Please join us in thanking this episode's executive producer, Efren Kolunga, who has just completed his first year as a top-tier member of our channel. Thank you, Efren Kolunga. You have truly helped us to stay online. In return, Efren gets to see our secret uncensored Dogman stories, of which we're going to have four in a row. That's tonight, tomorrow, and the next two nights after. A brand new secret and uncensored Dogman story that nobody in the public gets to see or hear only channel members and if you want to find out how to join then check out what our international tv spokesmongrel henry lee dogman has to say hank thanks biggie and thanks to all of you for watching this far if you liked it please click like if you'd like to see more of our work please subscribe and also click that bell icon if you'd like to be notified when we put out a new episode. To become an executive producer, you can donate to us through the thanks button under each of our videos or through our paypal.me slash peterbernard209 page. To receive cool perks like secret uncensored Dogman episodes far too wild to ever run on this channel, you can become a YouTube channel member by clicking the join button or Join our PayPal Subscribers Club at PeterBernard.com. Joining either at the $3 a month level or above gets you access to our over 25 hours of secret uncensored Dogman stories available nowhere else. Do you have a scary story about Dogman or some other kind of high strangeness that happened to you? Let us know by emailing us at scarystoriesnyc at gmail.com or by leaving us a voicemail message at 804 Lascari. You may need to call back on that when it cuts off after I think three minutes. And if you don't want to do any of that stuff, thank you for simply watching to the end. Good night, and have a scary tomorrow. Scary, scary stories. stories.